a uh, few years ago at the church that I was serving, I was involved with, uh, with the youth ministry at that church, and uh, I was, uh, was on a, a service trip with a bunch of the youth, and they, they, they caught me up, they gave me a, an education on some of the contemporary slang that uh, the teenagers use these days, and, and I know that some of you think that I'm just like incredibly cool, but actually... I'm not, and, uh, and my slang is usually like 10, 15 years old, so this was great. This was a real education moment for me, and I, I want to let you in on some of these, some of these words. I want, I want to give you a bit of an education as, as well. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the, the terms I learned was to throw shade at somebody. Throwing shade means that you're, you're dissing them, you're insulting them, you're saying bad. It's not something you want to be doing, but that's what it means to throw shade. Uh, being salty is similar. It is not actually like the Bible, you know, like be salt and light. It's not like that. It's, it's kind of throwing shade at people. You're being salty when you do that. Uh, I learned the words on fleek. Have you ever heard of on fleek before? Uh, so it, it's when something is really on its game, when something is, is looking really good. So you might go, your eyebrows are really on fleek today. Uh, and not that I look at eyebrows or, or notice them, but that was the example that was given to me a few years ago. Your eyebrows are really on fleek. Uh, similar thing would be calling something fire. Not on fire, but just fire. Like your car is really fire, man. Um, it's not on fire. That would be a bad thing. But it is fire. Uh, and, and so the, these are the kinds of terms. Now there's another term that, uh, that you may have heard before. And it's, it's to call yourself or to call somebody else woke. Have you ever heard that before? When you're woke, it's, it's really just, at, at its essential level, a really grammatically incorrect saying of, uh, grammatically incorrect way of saying awake. But it, it's to be, to be woke is to be, to be alert, to be in step, to be sensitive to the, uh, especially the injustice in the world. Not to be sleeping, but to really be a, a, awake to that, that kind of thing. Uh, kind of like the Matrix, to use an uncool analogy from 15 years ago. Uh, the Matrix, you know, everybody is kind of sleeping. They're all, they're all in this computer simulated world. And, and then there's a select few who are really woke, who are, who are aware of what's actually going on. And that's, that's the kind of idea behind that. Now, a few weeks ago, I basically told you that Jesus wants you to be woke, is what it, what it amounted to. Uh, we were in Mark chapter 13, where Jesus uses all this kind of big, scary, uh, cataclysmic language to talk about the judgment that is coming. Uh, and I know that some of you were like, man, I felt really anxious when we were even reading that passage because it's just so intense. But at the center of that, I said that, that what Jesus is calling us to do and to be is to be awake, uh, to be alert, to be on guard, to be keeping watch. All of those ideas come back to the same central kind of idea of being awake. And what I, I probably didn't do a good enough job of a few weeks ago was explaining what exactly it means to be awake. Uh, and uh, Lori actually helped remedy that through her newsletter article, which was great. And this morning I'm going to try to remedy that as, as well. Because in the text that we're in this morning, Jesus kind of picks that up again. That, that, that idea, that theme of being awake kind of gets picked up again. So we'll look at a few ways uh, that it, what, in which it means to be to be spiritually awake. So we'll get there from Mark chapter 14, verses 27 to 42. Mark 14, 27 to 42. Uh, and this is uh, just after the Last Supper and Jesus and the disciples leave the upper room and they're on their way to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter declared... Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. 
Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. Then when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. And returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting enough? The time has come. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. This, 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 um, this narrative, this story, I mean, it just, it just puts us in this moment in Jesus' life where everything just comes crashing down. This, this, this terrible, awful thing that he's known that he's going to need to do to face the sins of the world at the cross, all of a sudden is not, is not somewhere off in the distance. It's now. It's tonight. And you've probably been in a situation like that where you knew that something really uh, bad, something that you dreaded, was coming, but it was off in the distance, so you, you could kind of put it off. You didn't have to think about it. And then all of a sudden, one day, there it was, face to face, and you couldn't avoid it, and it was this like crushing weight on you. That's what happens to Jesus, and really to the disciples as well. But they respond to it very differently. Jesus and the disciples respond to it very differently, and the contrast between them, I think, reveals what it means to be spiritually awake or spiritually asleep. And so I want to look at the, the, the contrast between them. And I'm going to actually use some alliteration here. I don't usually do this, but this morning I'm going to be alliterative. And some of you are like, this is all I've ever wanted is for Craig to be alliterative. Well, it's happening this morning. It's good news for you. Uh, the first way in which I, I, I think we see the contrast between awake and sleeping is that being awake, spiritually awake, means, means humility instead of hubris. means humility instead of hubris. So Jesus says to to Peter and the disciples, he says, you're going to all fall away. And he he quotes from Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13 is this passage where God says, there's a shepherd over my people. I'm going to strike the shepherd. The sheep are going to be scattered. But in that passage, it goes on to say that God is going to use this event somehow redemptively, that he's going to draw his people back to himself. He's going to form a new people. Uh, and, And when you look at that, when you read Zechariah 13, it's just hard not to see Jesus fulfilling that. The shepherd being struck down, the sheep scattering, but a new people being formed as a result. That, that's what's happening here. So Jesus says, look, you, this is part of the whole thing. You're all going to fall away. Now when somebody tells you, you are going to fail, how do you respond? How do you respond to that? You, you could respond to it with the, uh, we could call it the Eeyore approach, which would be the kind of like, yeah, you're right. I'm terrible. I'm going to fail. Yeah, you got me. So that would be one approach. Another approach would be, uh, we could call it the prove them approach, where you kind of puff out your chest. You go, oh yeah? Watch me. I'm going to succeed your socks off. I'm going to not fail so hard. You're going to be so sorry you said that. I'm going to do so awesome. And that's kind of Peter's approach, right? He, he kind of does the prove them thing. And, and what's funny is that he kind of throws the other disciples under the bus when he does it, right? He kind of goes, yeah, Jesus, you're right. These guys, they're definitely going to fall away. They're failures. They're class A jokers. You know, there's no way they're going to be faithful. But not me, Jesus. Not me. Whatever happens to you, I'm sticking with you. If you suffer, I'm going to suffer. You get arrested, I'm going to get arrested. If, if you die, I'm going to die. I'm the rock, Jesus. That's what you called me. You called me Peter. I'm the rock. I'm steady. I'm strong. I'm not going anywhere. And all the other disciples kind of think the same thing. They're all like, yeah, no. I would never fall away. They all, they all are so confident this. Never, Jesus. I would never, ever do that. Here's the thing. We are the most vulnerable to failure when we are most convinced of our immunity to it. We're most vulnerable to failure when we're most convinced of our immunity to it. When you think that you're the only one who's awake and that everybody else is sleeping, everybody else has their eyes closed, but you alone see things clearly, uh, that might actually be a sign that you're more asleep than you know. And think about it in terms of temptation. Let's say that you're somebody who really, really loves your spouse. Love you, you, if, if, speaking from a guy's perspective, you really love your wife. 
You have a great marriage, super solid. You think she's, she's just beautiful. You're attracted to her. You're like, there's no way that I could ever cheat on my wife. There's just no circumstances under which I would falter in this. Like our marriage is so strong. I love her so much. There's just no way. I'm just not even worried about the possibility. And so if, if you're so convinced of your immunity to any kind of temptation, let's say at work you've, you've got an attractive coworker and that person is, is giving you attention and you, you're not really bothered by it because, you know, whatever, it's not even an issue. Like I'd never, I would never cheat. I'm just, I'm totally immune to that. Uh, and, and, and it kind of grows, you know, you build this friendship and you're, you're going for coffee, you're going for lunch and you, again, you're like, oh, there's just no way, there's no danger here at all. And then all of a sudden, one day, you and your wife have a big fight, and you kind of confide in your coworker about it, and, and things kind of get worse with your wife, and, and, and maybe she doesn't quite look quite as good as she did. And, and all of a sudden, you're finding yourself in compromising situations because your guard was down. You were convinced that you were so strong that this would never be an issue. And because of that, all of a sudden, you're finding yourself more vulnerable to, temp- to temptation than you ever would have thought. Again, you are most vulnerable when you're most convinced of your immunity. It's a dangerous thing to overestimate your strength and to underestimate the challenge. So what's, what's the alternative for, for Peter and for the disciples? On the one hand, you could argue there really wasn't an alternative because Jesus said, this is, this is what's going to happen. You are all going to fall away. And that gets into the whole question of divine sovereignty and human freedom and, uh, and, and, and to really short circuit a whole big complex conversation, I think we just have to say somehow we are both totally responsible for our actions and yet God also knows what we're going to do. It's, it's like both of, those, both of those things. So the disciples are still responsible for this. But if there was an alternative, what would it be? Wouldn't it be for Peter and the disciples, to be humble enough to ask for help? To say to Jesus, yeah, you're right, we, we are vulnerable to failure. We, we, we've seen that in ourselves, that, that we have that within us. So, so show us how not to. Teach us how to avoid uh, falling away. Wouldn't it be humility to say, yeah, you're right and we need help? I mean, in some ways... I know it's not a perfect contrast, but in some ways that's what Jesus does, isn't it? Like he, he's going to spend the night in the Garden of Gethsemane pouring his heart out because he's aware of the challenge and he's looking for strength. The Son of God is humble enough to look for strength in this moment. Now if that's the case, then, then that's, that's what being awake looks like. It looks like humility. I know that I, I, I talk a lot about this kind of thing. And if you, if you know me, if you've been here at the bridge, you know that this is, this is, this is my heart. This is my longing. Uh, and, and I've used a whole bunch of different terms or ideas or words uh, to describe it, but it all boils down to, to being, for us as a church, to be awake, to be fully alive, to be renewed, to be revived, to be the kind of church that God wants us to be, to be the kind of church we see in Acts 2, to see the fullness of God's glory in our midst. I mean, all of this is kind of, it's all, it's all what, like, my, I, if, you could, if you want to say my vision for the church, where I want us to go, this is where I want us to go. I want us to be fully awake and alive. And, and, and just radically committed to Christ, all that stuff. But listen, if, I, if, if you hear me saying to you, it's time to wake up, you got to know that I'm saying it to myself first. As much as I want renewal and revival for us as a church, I want it for myself. I want to be more awake. I want to know more of God's life in my life. And so while I fall short in a whole bunch of ways, this is one thing that I can say, that when it comes to being awake, I know that I'm not there and that I need more of that. So again, when you hear me say, wake up, know that I'm saying it to myself first. And when I say, wake up, if you think that you're immune to that, if you think that doesn't apply to you, if you think that somehow you don't need to hear that or you're offended by it, then consider your similarity to Peter. Consider that that might actually mean that you're more asleep than you are awake. Humility is huge when it comes to being spiritually awake. And what that humility naturally leads to is prayer instead of pleasure. 
I don't know if pleasure is really the right word for this, but it starts with P. So there it is. Prayer instead of pleasure. That, that's what happens here, right? Jesus uh, takes the disciples, takes them into the Garden of Gethsemane, takes the three, his three inner circle, brings them with him, and he tells them, you got to pray. And that's what he does. He goes and he, and he spends his time in prayer, but they just sleep. And so he rebukes them for it. And on one level, you could totally understand why they're sleepy. The Passover meal that they just came from generally, traditionally, ended around midnight. So we're into the wee hours of the morning here. They've had a big, you know, feast. They've had a roast lamb. They've drank like four glasses of wine. Looked at last week. Yeah, they're tired. It's been a big week. There's been a lot that's happened. They're sleepy. That's understandable. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with sleep. Young children would have you believe otherwise, but they're misguided little creatures who don't know anything. There's nothing wrong with sleep. There's nothing wrong with recreation. There's nothing wrong with enjoying God's creation, with taking rest. I mean, Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. It's kind of written into the rhythm of creation. So there's nothing wrong with with sleep, with rest, with recreation, that kind of thing. That's not the issue. The issue is the circumstances. The issue is not understanding the moment and what the moment calls for. So, for example, if I, if I told you that there was going to be an earthquake in half an hour, and that's not prophetic, by the way. I didn't have a dream about that or anything. But if I told you hypothetically, and it was somehow credible that there was going to be an earthquake in half an hour, and you were like, hmm, Yeah, but I was going to go hit the slopes. I was going to go get a ski run in. I think I'm still going to do that. Not really worried about this earthquake thing. I'm going to to go on to the mountain. Now, generally speaking, there's nothing wrong with going skiing. I personally hate the snow, and so that's me. But if you don't, great, go. But that's not what's called for at this moment. The mountain is not where you want to be. It's not what you want to be doing when the earthquake hits. Or if I told you that for some reason there was going to be a massive shortage of food and that you needed to get to Superstore as quick as possible and stock up and you were like, "Mm, I was kind of planning on doing a 12-hour Lord of the Rings marathon and I think I'm going to do that instead because that that just sounds like more fun than sitting at Superstore for like three hours in a lineup, even if I have my cool groceries for giving gift card. Uh, Still... Still, the Lord of the Rings thing sounds more fun. And, and again, like, there's nothing wrong. With, and there might be something wrong with watching 12 hours straight. But there's nothing wrong with Lord of the Rings. Lots of people have come up with great sermon analogies, spiritual illustrations from it. It's great. But it's not what the moment calls for. It, there, there's a desperation here. There's an urgency here to take certain actions. And, and so the disciples here uh, don't understand the moment. If they did, they wouldn't need to sleep. When our bodies understand that there's danger, that there's urgency, they're capable of incredible things. You've all heard stories of people who are just pumped full of adrenaline and lift way heavier things than they could ever lift otherwise because that's what the moment calls for. Um, If you've ever watched the show 24, you see Jack Bauer running around for 24 hours chasing terrorists and subverting assassination plots. And he's not sleepy. You know, he's, he's not falling asleep because there's this urgency. There's this like, I need to stop this. If the disciples understood the urgency of the moment, they would not have needed to sleep. And if we understand the urgency of our moment, I don't think that we would be sleepy either. Now, what's the alternative? How do we respond to the moment? Well, look what Jesus does. He prays. He goes right to prayer. And I want to look at three characteristics of this prayer. So we've got like a three-point sermon. Now we've got a three-point subsection. It's very symmetrical. Right in the middle of the sermon, we've got a three-point subsection. Here it is. Three points about, about Jesus' prayer. First, it's, it's characterized by intimacy. Jesus starts out the prayer by saying, Abba, Father. And Abba, as a lot of you know, was the Aramaic term of endearment for a father. It meant something like Daddy. Uh, it's, this, it's this affectionate, kind of tender term, Abba, Daddy. That, that's how Jesus refers to God the Father. And, and this was not a typical way of praying in the first century. This isn't how the rabbis would pray, but it kind of unveils Jesus' own unique relationship with the Father. 
And we could go a few steps further here. We could talk about Trinitarian theology. We could talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three and yet one in the communion they enjoy with one another. And so Jesus has this, this communion, this intimacy with his, his Father that just kind of dwarfs anything that we see in human creation. But the incredible thing in the New Testament is that this kind of relationship with a holy, transcendent, almighty God who was saying about him before judges the wicked. He's, he's an awesome God. He's, he's overall, first and the last, beginning and the end, that we can have a relationship with this God where we call him Abba. Where we call this God, Daddy. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, we read that in a couple places in the New Testament. So here you see Jesus saying it. Galatians 4, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our heart. The spirit who calls out Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit dwells within us and allows us to call God Abba. Romans 8, Paul says something similar. He says, The Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him, by the Spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. We have the Holy Spirit of Jesus in our hearts for those who trust in Him, and so we are able to approach God in this way, Abba, Daddy. And I I just, I want to say that I know that for some of us, that term, Daddy, doesn't even necessarily evoke the best images or feelings. For some it does, others it doesn't. I don't think that's reason to discard the term or the image. I think it just means that we need to let Jesus redefine what it means for God to be dad, for God to be daddy. I think we've got to come back and and see what it means for Jesus, his spirit in our hearts. That's what it means for for us. So just just say that. So his his prayer is characterized by intimacy. and, And I wonder how much of our praying feels cold and distant because it lacks this intimacy. It lacks this firm foundation that when I approach God, I approach him as, as daddy. Um, and so it's intimate. His, Jesus' prayer is also authentic. It's so real, isn't it? I mean, here he is, and he prays that that, that the hour would pass from him. He asks that this cup would be taken from him. Here's Jesus, the Son of God, with the most important job that anybody's ever had right before him. And he says to God, I don't want to do it. I want this cup to be taken from me. I want this hour to pass. I don't want to do it. He's so honest with God about where he's at here. And I've seen this in my own prayers. Maybe you have too. How much of a difference authenticity makes? Because it's, it's difficult. It's hard to be authentic with God in prayer, isn't it? It's hard to be authentic with him, especially when you're praying together with other people. And, and that is so important. It's so important to be praying together with other people. Jesus says two or three gathered in his name, praying in agreement. There's power in that. So important to be praying with people. But it is difficult to be authentic in that because you're so worried about what people think of you. You're so concerned. It's like you're putting on a a performance here when you're praying together with other people. And if you ever manage a moment of authenticity, now you're thinking, maybe they reckon, maybe they maybe they saw that. Maybe they think better of me. You know, maybe they saw how authentic I was, and now I got some like gold stars in their spiritual notebook they're keeping of everybody they encounter. I just raised my standing in their books because they saw how authentic I was, and all of a sudden you're not being authentic anymore at all because you're just worried about what they think of you. I mean, we just need to be freed from this tyranny of the opinion of others, don't we? We need the Lord to free us from this. Because it's it's, it's a block to us being authentic in in our praying. And it's hard to to be authentic in our praying with other people, but it actually is hard to be authentic in our prayers just one-on-one with God too. At least I've found that to be. I found that oftentimes I'm either over-dramatizing something, making it bigger than it really is, or I'm downplaying something and kind of hiding it from him, not being real about it either. But God wants me to just come and say, this is how it is. This this is what I'm going through. This is what I'm experiencing. Jesus, Jesus, this this is what it actually is. That's what he wants. That's, That's what he gets that's what the Father gets from Jesus, is this, this just brutal honesty. Like, here is what, here's what I'm going through. This is what I actually want. The third aspect of, the, of Jesus' prayer here, I think, is not only that it's intimate and authentic, but that it ultimately surrenders to God's will. 
And, and I, I know that a lot of times if we're feeling like we got to be really spiritual, we go straight to this. We go straight to the surrendering thing. We go straight to, okay, God, just your will be done, your will be done, your will be done. But I want to pull these two points together and say Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't go straight to that. He first prays, um, it, prays that the cup would be taken from him. Uh, Tim Keller, I, I quote him fairly often, he's, he's written a book on uh, the, uh, the Gospel of Mark, and he kind of goes through it piece by piece. It's called um, Jesus the King, I think is the updated uh, version of it. And in, in the section on, on the Garden of Gethsemane, Keller talks about how Jesus prays his loudest desires, but then he submits them to his deepest desires. So his loudest desire is not to go through with this, but he prays through that and gets to his deepest desire, which is for the will of of his Father, to be done. And I would recommend that as the way that we should pray as well, that we should not be afraid of praying our loudest desires, even if we know that they're not necessarily right or correct. Pray them, and then come through that and get to your deepest desire. Which, if you are a follower of Jesus, and you trust and believe that God is good, that he's better than anything else, your desire is going to be for God's will to be done, because you believe that it is better than anything else. That's going to be your deepest desire to see God's will be done. So pray through your loudest desires, and get to your deepest desire, which is for the Lord's will to be done. Prayer that is spiritually awake is authentic, it's intimate, and it's surrendering. And again, if we really understood the moment, I couldn't help, but th- I can't help but think that our prayer would start to, to look different, uh, both, both individually and corporately together. It would look different. I, I can't help but think that the reason it's so hard to get Christians in the West to be praying is because we don't understand the moment. And I've, I've seen this. It's not just, it's not just us. It's every, every church I've been in In the West, it's so hard to get people praying, at least praying together. I have no idea what people do on their own, but it's really hard to get people praying together. And I I just wonder, again, is it because we don't understand the urgency? You know, from, let's say from from here, from from Cap U to Deep Cove, we're talking almost 25,000 people who live in this stretch of land. And according to the last census that was taken, a solid half of those people claim absolutely no affiliation with any kind of religious faith. Over, about, about half. The vast majority of the remainder of that um, say that they're affiliated with one of the mainline kind of Christian denominations, United Church, Catholic, Anglican, um, especially. And if you know kind of the scene of those denominations, you know that while there are people within those churches and within those traditions that are really alive and committed to Christ, there are also many who show up to church once a, once a year. They're, Christ, they're Christers, I think is what it's called, Christmas, Easter kind of attendees, and that's it. And, and so we would say that the vast majority of people in this stretch of land do not have a saving faith in Jesus. And then you add to that that we live in a very affluent area where people have all kinds of avenues to, to spend their money, to, to spend their time. We've got the mountains and we've got the ocean and we've got all these recreational opportunities, which is great, but it, it, it kind of gets people to the place where they go, well, my life is pretty good here. I don't, I don't really need anything more. I don't really need the Jesus. I don't need other people uh, who are like-minded in this. I don't need any of that. And, and then you add to that also this, this general post-Christian cultural milieu that we're in where all of these perspectives and worldviews and ideas that once were moored in Christian faith have become disconnected and now actually oppose and contradict Christian faith and that this is where a lot of people are. You put all of that stuff together and you go, man, our challenge is pretty huge. I mean, God has called us as a church this place. Look at the challenge. I mean, if what Jesus says is true, thousands and thousands of our neighbors are perishing apart from him. And again, if we got that, if we understood that, if we understood the urgency of the moment, would we not be praying more? Being awake, spiritually awake, inescapably means being people of prayer. And you pray and you pray and you ask for things to happen. It doesn't happen the way you want or as quickly as you would expect. And it's easy to get frustrated. 
You know, you're, you're humble, you're praying, and yet it's easy to get frustrated, to grow in, in despair because things aren't happening the way you, you thought they would. And so, and, and so the third thing I, I see here about being spiritually awake is that it is about commitment instead of caving. It's about commitment instead of caving. And again, I think you see that with Jesus. I want to I look especially at Jesus here. I learned something cool about uh, the Garden of Gethsemane this week. And I'm about to pastor nerd out on you here. Um, I, I got uh, a, a, a book called A Geographical Commentary on the Gospels, which just made my day. I opened it up. It just gave me so much joy. It was like Christmas. I, it was just it was so exciting. I, I'm sure all of you can relate to that, of course. Uh, so I opened this up, and I read this section on the Garden of Gethsemane, and it pointed out some of the geography around the garden and around Jerusalem as a whole. So if you're in Jerusalem and you, and you, go, you, you leave Jerusalem going to the east, you go down the Kidron Valley, and then you come up the other side, and I've, I've been there, so I've, I've done this walk too. You down, go down through the Kidron Valley, and then you come up on the other side onto the Mount of Olives. And on the other side of the Mount of Olives is actually where Bethany is. That's the town that Jesus and the disciples stay in while they're in Jerusalem. They go for the evenings, they stay in Bethany. So on the other side of the Mount of Olives is is Bethany. And then after that is is the wilderness. From there until Jericho, it's, it's the Judean wilderness. And this route, east of Jerusalem, through the valley, over the mountain of all Mount of Olives, into the wilderness, this was the route of escape. Uh, in Israel's history. So, for example, David, when he was king of Israel, his son Absalom made a play for the throne. He rebelled re- against David, and David fled from Jerusalem, and he went east, and he went, uh, he went through the valley, over the mountain, and, 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 and on. That, that's how David escaped. Uh, when Zedekiah was the last king of Judah, and the Babylonians were squeezing in on, on Jerusalem, there was danger there, it was about to fall. Zedekiah escapes, escapes east out of Jerusalem into the wilderness. He got caught, but that was the route that he went. When the prophet Ezekiel uh, sees a vision of the glory of the Lord departing from the temple, he sees the glory leaving the temple, going east of Jerusalem, uh, stopping over the Mount of Olives, and then continuing on. Over and over again, this route is the route of escape when there's danger in Jerusalem. The Garden of Gethsemane is on the Mount of Olives, and it was probably just a few steps off this path. And so here's Jesus. In the Garden of Gethsemane, they were in Jerusalem. They've come to the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that people are gathering in Jerusalem to come and arrest him. He knows that there's danger in Jerusalem. And now he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying through this temptation. And I think that part of this temptation, and I'm I'm, I'm not making this up. I mean, I've got this from other people. But part of this temptation is the temptation to just keep walking. To just follow the escape route. To get out like many have done before. There's danger in Jerusalem. Just keep on walking. All he needs to do is take a few steps. He's on the path. He can get into the wilderness. He spent 40 days in the wilderness earlier surviving without any food. He's done this before. So it's just get on the path and keep walking. The escape route is right there. And you've probably been in a place like that before. Where you felt like the moment, the challenge that you were facing was so daunting that it was too big, too difficult for you. And you just wanted to get out. You just wanted to leave and you even saw the escape hatch. It was right there. You, it was there for the taking. I've been in that place. I've been in that place where you just feel like your work is futile. Where you're, you're just so tired and worn down and you just want to get on that path and keep going. And sometimes that's the thing to do. I mean, Jesus says in Mark 13, when when this cataclysm comes to Jerusalem, people need to flee Jerusalem. There is a time to, to get out. But there is also a time to understand that this is what God is calling you to and to stick it out, to be committed to what God has given you. There is a time and a place for that. Now, how do you know what the season is. How do you know what to do in your particular situation? Well, you got to do what Jesus did. You got to spend some serious time in prayer. Because it was clear as Jesus spent this time in prayer, praying his loudest desires, submitting them to his deepest desires, it was clear to him that he could not escape, that he could not continue on this path, but that he was to stay, he was to wait, he was to be arrested, 
And ultimately, he was to drink this cup that was dying this, this death, going to the cross. For Jesus, being awake in this moment meant being committed to what God had given him. And a lot of us owe our lives to Jesus' decision to stick it out in the Garden of Gethsemane. We owe our lives spiritually. We owe our lives eternally. We owe the joy and the peace and the forgiveness that we have to Jesus' commitment to sticking it out here and not, and not taking the escape route. I mean, I've, I've kind of alluded to it a few times, but Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is not just looking at his death. He's not just thinking, I'm about to die and I need to deal with this. It's a lot bigger than that. Jesus knows that he is going to be facing the brunt of human rebellion against God. He is going to be bearing the weight of the sins of the world upon him, upon his shoulders. That he who knew no sin was going to become sin for us. That all of God's judgment, all of God's wrath against sin, because God loves creation. He loves life. He loves health. He hates everything that's opposite. Jesus was going to bear God's judgment and wrath against sin, against evil, upon himself. That's something none of us can even start to imagine what that would have been like to be aware that that was his task. That was the road ahead of him. But because Jesus did that, all of us who trust in him, all of us who follow him, all of us who receive him, and I know a lot of what I've been saying this morning is, is especially for those who are already followers and need to wake up. But, but this, is, this, is, this is the good news for everybody. That all who trust in Jesus, because of Jesus' commitment here, they have forgiveness of sins. They're, they're washed clean. They, they, they're, they're, their judgment, their punishment has been taken. They're set free. They're adopted into the family of God. Able to call God Abba. Able to be children of God. This is what happens because Jesus was committed to the very end. And by the way, I think too the reason that Jesus was able to commit and to see this through was because he saw what was coming on the other side. He knew that on the other side of this was resurrection. He knew that on the other side of this was our salvation. He knew that on the other side of this was us being welcomed into his family. He saw what was coming and he was able to see this difficulty through. A little while back, I was, uh, I was experiencing temptation and, and it felt... It felt overwhelming. It felt daunting. It felt too strong. And then I had this thought come to me. If you can see this through, there's something better on the other side. If you can see this through, there's something better on the other side. And I believe that was from the Lord. And that thought is what got me through that temptation. Believing and trusting God when he says there's something better on the other side. Know that when you are committed to what God has given you. Being spiritually awake means trusting that there's something better on the other side. So my brothers and sisters, we got to wake up. we got to wake up. We need to be pursuing humility instead of hubris. We need to be pursuing prayer instead of pleasure. We need to be pursuing commitment instead of caving. We need to be doing this because our Lord and Savior Jesus has done it before us. And not only has he done it before us, but by doing it, Jesus actually wakes us up. It is through what Jesus has done that we, that we, that we wake up, that we're, that we're shaken uh, from our slumber, that we were dead in our transgressions, our sins, and he's made us alive. It's because of Jesus. It's Jesus who wakes us up. So this morning, if you want to wake up, if you are wanting to become woke, alive and alert to what's actually happening in this world, then call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. He wants you to encounter the trials of this life with the full measure of his strength. So wake up in Jesus' name.